Welcome. I am a lay Shin Buddhist who nevertheless maintains an interest in the broader realm of Pure Land and Mahayana Buddhist teachings. My YouTube channel is called Akala Akala, that is A-C-A-L-A-A-C-A-L-A. -A 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 -A. In these podcasts, I make a non-scholarly, humble, and sometimes bumbling attempt to explore a particular topic or question related to the wonderful Buddha Dharma. I hope you find them to be of interest. With that said, let us begin. So, in this podcast, I want to talk a little bit about Tan Luan, who was the, according to Shinran, the third patriarch of Shin Buddhism. And I want to make reference first to the so-called Shinshu Saiten. This is a Jodo Shin Buddhist teaching volume that was published by the Buddhist Churches of America back in 1978. You know, the content is fantastic because it contains translations of, you know, most of Shinran's writings. Now, we have the more modern two-volume set regarding Shinran's writings, and that is a wonderful, wonderful resource. But in any case, I want to poke my nose into this Shinshu Saiten, and as a prelude to Shinran's Hymns on the Patriarchs, where he talks about each of the seven patriarchs of Shin Buddhism, there's reference to this third patriarch, Tan Luan, whose name in Japanese is Don Ran. And it's noteworthy here, to my mind, that the first two patriarchs are, are Indian, namely uh, Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu. So Tan Luan is the first of the Chinese patriarchs of Shin Buddhism, or Jodo Shinshu. And in the Shinshu Saiten, it's noted that it is Tan Luan whose birth and death dates were 476 to 542, who gives first definition to the fundamental outlook of the popular Pure Land tradition. A famous scholar of the Madhyamika philosophy, he devoted himself to Pure Land Buddhism, and with a concern characteristic of the later Chinese and Japanese masters, worked on its propagation among ordinary people. His great scholarly accomplishment was to effect a union between the Pure Land teachings of the two Indian Mahayana schools. And here I believe what's being referred to is what was previously mentioned as the Madhyamika philosophy of Nagarjuna, who basically focused in and zeroed in on the idea of emptiness or sunyata, and really, in a brilliant way, you know, argued the philosophy of emptiness through a series of negations in terms of the fact that reality is not this, it's not that, it's not the other. And then, of course, the other was the Yogacara school of Vasubandhu, which was a mind-only school. So again, apparently, what Tan Luan was able to do was to integrate these and also then integrate those wonderful early Mahayana schools with Pure Land teaching. And in terms of propagation, it's interesting that he had this impulse. You know, Buddhism is not by its nature, well, maybe it is, a, 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 a missionary type religion, but it's certainly not a heavy handed one uh, like some religions are in terms of, you know, going around the world sort of twisting arms trying to get people to convert to our particular faith. But there is this impulse, and I think it's a generalized impulse with any sort of person of religion, a person who finds truth within a particular conceptual framework that resonates with their their sort of inner experience of of reality and of the nature of their own self and their own life, it's a natural kind of tendency to want to share that with other people. And again, hopefully, <laughs> to my mind, in terms of my bias, to do so in a, in a fairly soft, tactful, respectful way, which is, I hope, what I'm trying to do through my through my podcasts and through my YouTube uploads. Anyway, that's my my thought about it and my hoped-for approach, and I hope nobody out there sees me as heavy-handed in that regard. But in any case, in his commentary on Vasubandhu's Treatise on the Pure Land, Tan Luan, the Shinshu Saiten says, reinterprets Vasubandhu's systemization of the Pure Land from the standpoint of emptiness, pointing out that the source of the 29 features of the Pure Land lies in the dual aspects of emptiness, the transcendent truth which negates all characteristics and the potentiality which gives rise to particular forms. Thus he explains, quote, 
Because the Dharma nature, or Dharmata, is stilled of attachment, that's S-T-I-L-L-E-D, is stilled of attachment, the Dharma state, or Dharmakaya, is formless. Because it is formless, it can express itself in any form. Hence, the features of the Buddha and the adornments of the Pure Land, which are precisely the Dharma state. Close quote. So, you'll recall or you'll know that the Dharmakaya, in terms of the three bodies of Buddha or the Trikaya doctrine, the Dharmakaya is the ultimate Buddha, Buddha body, which cannot be characterized with any words or concepts. It's beyond all words. It's inexpressible. But here Tan Luan is, is equating it with Amida Buddha and the Pure Land. And as I'm reading it, what I would do in my own mind is kind of tie this in with the Heart Sutra that I've been reflecting on a fair amount recently. In the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara communicates the notion to Shariputra that form is emptiness and emptiness is form. Form is no different from emptiness and emptiness is no different from form. So we don't want to create a dualism, you know, between the Dharmakaya and the and the Sambhogakaya and the Nirmanakaya, in other words, the three Buddha bodies. The three Buddha bodies are one. And so maybe this is one way we can view Tan Wan's commentary there. But again, in the Shinshu Saiten, it says, in this way, Amida is seen as arising through the dynamism of emptiness, so that he is, quote, the body of real merit working in this world of samsara with a virtue that is pure and true. As Tom Lawn says, quote, Why is Amida's virtue not impure? Because it arises from the Dharma nature and is in accord with the two phases of the truth. Why is it not false? Because it embraces all beings and makes them enter the land of ultimate purity. Close quote. So in other words, according to the Shinshu Saiten authors, the adornment of the Buddha and the land are not inert symbols or representations, but rather they are the active embodiments of the truth, and as such they are the means and the merit that, quote, dispel the darkness of ignorance and fulfill all the desires of sentient beings, close quote. Moreover, because of this, quote, when we thoroughly examine the source of the five contemplative gates, we find that Amida is the decisive cause for attainment. Close quote. Now, I don't know enough about in Pure Land Doctrine to be able to explain to you right here what the five contemplative gates are, but I would take these to be self power practices, various forms of contemplation that earlier in the Pure Land tradition were part and parcel of the practice. And, and the repetition of Buddha's name was sort of one of many uh, sort of focal points for concentration that was designed to, I guess you could say, purify the mind or help a being to attain enlightenment. But in the context of Shin Buddhist uh, sort of doctrine or interpretation of these kinds of statements, the Shinshu Saiten says, It is here, in Tan Luan's discovery that the true source of merit lies not in a person's virtue or in his or her perseverance in contemplative exercises, but rather with the working of absolute truth that we see the true significance of Tan Luan's reinterpretation of the Mahayana basis of Pure Land teachings. In focusing on those aspects which are most concrete and most active, he radically alters the role of the Pure Land practicer. Tan Luan uses the terms self-power and other power to distinguish between a person's own efforts and Amida's virtue. So I guess that was correct that, again, the five contemplative gates relate to self-practice and, of course, our Pure Land approach, whether it be an earlier form or the more refined form of Shinran Shonen, is definitely an other power kind of approach to religion or spirituality. So in the Shinshu Saiten, they assert that Tan Luan points out that because self-power arises from the relative self, it inevitably involves the risk of deepening the illusory attachment whose suppression is the object of endeavor, and that its practicers are like silkworms fastening themselves with bonds of their own making. It is in the denial of self-power and in the free working of true compassion that liberation is to be realized. And what comes to mind here is 
something I read a long time ago. I think it may have been in Trungpa, uh, and he's just as many as his personal faults may have been. He, he's just a, a brilliant uh, fellow who did have, I think, a, a very enlightened mind, so to speak. And he talks about ego, and I think it was in Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, which is a great book you might want to consider getting. But anyhow, the idea that ego doesn't give up easily. Ego challenges and fights our efforts, if you will, to transcend it, to give it up, to let it go. And so that's part of the problem with the self-power kinds of approaches, that the, is that they can, they can translate into a kind of, as Trung Pao would say, spiritual materialism. In other words, not continuing to have greed or exercise the need or desire to bring things into our lives like, you know, big screen TVs or neat kinds of cell phones, but that, you know, people seeking spiritual enlightenment can, through that seeking, have that become an object of their desire, which they wish to obtain, so to speak, for themselves. And again, that's contradictory to what the, the true state of enlightenment is, which is a state of letting go, of giving up, of transcending ego, of realizing that I, me, and mine are illusions. So closing out the Shinshu Saiten commentary here, they say, the problem for the practicer then is the cultivation of sincere and single-minded devotion, which is receptive of Amida's power. So, so the idea is to be receptive of this gift that Amida wants to give us, which is, of course, then when we accept it, the experience of Shinjin, or faith. They say, this is accomplished by calling the name, which embodies Amida's virtue, with a realization of Amida's significance and with a faith that is pure, firm, and undistracted. So the name embodies Amida's virtue, and I think what Shinran says in terms of his interpretation is that it's Amida wanting to transfer merit to us, merit that is embodied in his name, in the phrase, Namo Amida Butsu. And so, closing out here from the Shinshu Saiten, they say, in laying the groundwork for this shift of concentration from contemplative discipline to the attitude of faith, Tan Luan transformed the Pure Land Bodhisattva practices into an independent way of enlightenment available to ordinary people. And my goodness, how critical was that? Because up until then, I would think that most of the Buddhist practicers were monks, or people who could spend full time doing this kind of thing and they had the opportunity for meditation. But listen, what I want to close with here, I've been reciting on my primary uh, YouTube channel called Akala Akala, gathas or verses, gathas in praise of the Buddha Amitabha, composed by the Dharma teacher Tom Luan. And these were translated into English by a fellow named Charles Patton. And again, remembering that Amitabha is one of two Sanskrit names for Amida, which means Buddha of infinite light, and his other name, of course, Amitayus, which is Buddha of infinite life. So again, I've been reciting these things that involve these verses, but what I didn't recite within the context of those particular series, which I think I put under the playlist of other pure land or faith-based kinds of teachings, what I didn't do was the chorus. And what I'd like to sort of close with here is the chorus from those verses by Tan Luan to give you a better idea of where his, his head was at and how he was viewing the Pure Land kind of devotional orientation in the context of his studies and his integration of Madhyamika and Yogacara with the Pure Land School. So here we go with that. The chorus. Nama to the thought of taking refuge in and prostrating to that Western Buddha Amitabha. His commiseration is protection covering us, causing the Dharma seed to grow and develop in this life and the next. I pray that the Buddha will always gather us up. I vow to be reborn with the sentient beings in the land of peaceful happiness, 
Nama to the thought of taking refuge in and prostrating to that Western Buddha world of bliss and the Bodhisattva of Alokitishvara. I vow to be reborn with the sentient beings in the land of peaceful happiness. Nama to the thought of taking refuge in and prostrating to that Western world of bliss and the Bodhisattva Mahasthama. I vow to be reborn with the sentient beings in the land of peaceful happiness. Nama, to the thought of taking refuge in and prostrating to that western world of bliss and the pure oceanic assembly of bodhisattvas. I vow to be reborn with the sentient beings in the land of peaceful happiness. Universally teaching the Sangha, father and mother, as well as being a good friend to the sentient beings of the Dharma Dhatu, he ends the three obstacles. Equally, being reborn in the land of the Buddha Amitabha, they take refuge and repent. So, since I can't resist babbling just a little bit more, let me just mention explicitly the fact that here he's referring to Avalokiteshvara and Mahasthama Prampta, who are the two bodhisattvas representing compassion and wisdom who flank Amida Buddha in all the iconographic kinds of portrayals, either in painting or in, or in various other kinds of artistic renderings. May anyone listening to this podcast also be reborn with the sentient beings in the land of peaceful happiness after this life in samsara ends. Namo Mirabutsu. With that, I will sign off by reciting the Nembutsu in gratitude for being embraced and accepted just as I am by Amida Buddha, never, never to be abandoned. Namo Mirabutsu. Namo Amida Boots. Namo Amida Boots. Namo Amida Boots.